Hi guys, today's guest is Bill Burgos. Bill is the Head of Strength and Conditioning at the Minnesota Timberwolves. I spoke to Bill back in September. He's a very passionate coach with a wealth of knowledge and experience from some really big organizations. In this episode, we're going to discuss his career working in the NBA, how to perform as a coach, and his new book. Please support the show and subscribe, and check out our Instagram page at Inform Performance. I'm really excited to have Bill Burgos on the show today. Bill, thank you for squeezing me into your busy schedule, mate. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, just to kick off, could you tell the listeners about who you are um, and your background? Well, um, of course, my name is Bill Burgos. Uh, I'm currently the head strength and conditioning coach for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, it's actually my 12th year uh, being in the league. Uh, I first started with the Orlando Magic as a intern, then became a strength and conditioning coordinator. And then from there, I uh, ended up getting the head strength conditioning coach position with the New York Knicks, spent a couple seasons there, returned back to Orlando for five seasons as the head strength coach, and then um, left there and actually spent a season as a consultant for the NBA Players Association, and then um, just recently got hired on with the Timberwolves. But that was my NBA career. Before that, I did two years with baseball with the Pittsburgh Pirates, did some stuff at college. I went to Austin Peay State University. And I did 13 years in the military, Army and Air Force combined before that as well. And how did you get your current kind of job and role? Um, how did that process take place? So um, the way I got into the NBA, I, of course, I, I'm bilingual. So I started off in baseball and it was kind of, I want to say it was a little bit easier for me to get a job in baseball. I started with the minor leagues and uh, ended up meeting um, Joe Rogowski, who at the time was the head strength coach for the Orlando Magic. And, um, you know, became good friends. And from there, he offered me an internship. And it's just built into a, a you know, position from there on. And, and then at that point, I just started meeting a lot of other strength coaches, athletic trainers, um, you know, people in the league office. And the point I'm trying to get at, one of the questions is, is, you know, how did I get my start in the league? And I always say network, 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 because every time you meet somebody, it's, it's known as an information interview. And so people are wanting to know who you are, what you're about. So that way they understand that you can fit into the organizational culture. And I think... Early on in my career, I met a lot of people and I really wanted to learn and, and they kind of knew the type of person I was. And, and from there, it's just, um, it was a, it, it opened up a lot of doors. Yeah, it was a natural, natural process for you. Mm -hmm. um, and you're at the Timberwolves now. What does your kind of staffing structure look like? Uh, so the way the Minnesota Timberwolves is staffed, uh, is structured is, um, so basically you have Greg Farnham and uh, Robbie Sicker. They're both VP. One is v Vice President of Sports Medicine. The other one is the Vice President of Performance and Technology, which is Robbie Sicker. At that point, um, for strength and conditioning, it's me. I'm the head strength coach, and I have an assistant, um, Kurt, and then I also have uh, a G League guy who's the head strength coach for the for the Iowa club, and his name is Charles Loftus. And, um, and, these, and basically from there, we basically oversee all strength and conditioning aspects and we kind of have an influence with, with, with nutrition, but we work hand in hand with our medical staff. It's a collaborative effort, so it's not just us. And then because even the medical side, they play a, a strong part in how we develop our guys as well. And so that's kind of like how we're structured, because uh, on the medical side, you have your physical therapists, you have your assistant athletic trainers, and you, as well as your GLE head athletic trainer as well. And they take a big portion of that medical component. And am I right in thinking you've got an AT background as well? I do not have an AT background. So my background started off in athletic training. So I was a student athletic trainer at Austin Peay State University. And I worked at the time, I, I was a student athletic trainer. I did it for about two and a half years. And I worked under um, Chuck Kimmel, who at the time was the president of the National Athletic Training Association. So during my time there, I learned a lot of athletic training. I have a strong medical background because I did about I want to say it was about seven years as a medical technician in the Air Force, and I was also an EMT. And um, and it's just when I started getting into athletic training, working on the Chuck, learned a lot, loved it, but uh, so I had a strong passion and performance. And so I started uh, heading towards strength and conditioning at that time. It was a little bit different back then. Sports science wasn't a big thing, even though uh, my degree is in exercise science, including my first master's. And uh, back then it was either you're a head strength coach or you're an athletic trainer. Now, the, you know, the the, the structure has changed as time moves forward and it continues to change. 
and so at the time I wanted to be a head strength coach and, and, and that's what I what I did yeah and what does a typical day look like for you at the moment granted I know that changes through the different <laughs> stages of the season but what's well uh, I tell you what like right now it's a little bit heck I don't want to say it's hectic but there's a lot going on because it's a new team for me um so uh, you know it's a new new team new uh, new new setting new environment so I'm trying to like I'm moving in at the same time so there's a lot of things going on and uh and plus it's a whole new staff so we're getting well getting to know each other pretty well and so all those things play a part but uh typically for an NBA season especially in the off season you know I come in quite early I usually get in like you know between 4 and 6 a.m depending and I'm uh, usually about three to four hours beforehand you know I like to work out you know meditate get myself going kind of like uh, look at my notes from the the previous day um, to see, you know, what things I need to add. If there was any last minute changes, you know, via text, whatever it is from the performance staff. And I start thinking about what to do that day. You know, um, even though I have a plan already, I start, you know, making some adjustments and looking at the flow. I put, I put that all on my boards. I have all my notes and everything ready. So once the guys start coming in, I've um, already had shared it with my, with my staff and we just start getting the guys rolling. And, um, but I mean, of course there's a part, um, in the program where we're going to start analyzing the guys and, and that's where we're at right now. We're kind of, kind of getting to feel who these guys are. What is it? What's the type of personality? What's their strength levels like, you know, what's their mobility movement like? And then, so we could start categorizing these guys and put them in specific groups so they could develop appropriately. And then, you know, we, throughout the day, you know, once practice and all that stuff starts, um, during the season, but in the off season, you know, once we, you know, have our training session, but during, during the season, once practice starts, we start, you know, talking and communicating and things like that. And then afterwards we kind of reevaluate what we did and what we did wrong. What could we, what can we do better? And then we start making those changes forward and then we start planning for the next day. But it's a typically like a 12 to 14 hour day, basically. It's hard work then. And I think this is probably quite relevant to where you're at in the season now, but when you're assessing a basketball player physically, is there certain things that you're prioritizing or certain physical qualities that you're looking for? Yeah. So, so right now is, um, is really their off time. So, uh, guys come in when they want, so it's optional. Um, but when the guys do come in, um, you know, I, I look at them and what I try to look for is movement in general. Like what can they do? You know, can he handle their body weight? And, you know, um, so I start to uh, focus on that first. Can he do things, um, you know, with what any person would do, like whether it's a reverse lunge, whatever the case may be. I start looking at these key movements and I start working on that body weight alone. And then we'll go into like these certain several phases, where, whether it's, you know, starting strength, whatever it is. But before we add any type of re- external resistance, I just want to make sure that they could just handle their own body weight. And what I've learned is like a lot of these guys are typically super young, poor training history. They're very talented. They can move, but they just can't handle their own body weight. And so my my job at this point is to make sure they can control their body in various movements. We build on that, look at their mobility. And then once we could, we feel like they're functionally uh, able to do things, then we start externally loading them. And then from there, we just build. Is there kind of percentages or loads that you, you're aware you need to hit with them later after that stage, or does that not come into it too much? Say, say that again? Is there kind of percentages and loads that come into what they need to be able to achieve later on, or is that something that's not too important with these guys? Well, you know, once we start doing the starting strength and we start really getting loading, the, yeah, the percentages does play a role because um, the idea is to but – but I also look at the amount of force. Because what I'm trying to figure out is what, because in other words, what I don't want to do is let's say we, we, we operate at a low force here in the weight room and it and clearly does not, um, you know, mimic what's happening on the floor or, you know, then there's a problem. I'm not bridging that gap. So I want to, one is I do want to gradually build up to the amount of force that's being applied in the weight. I mean, on the, the basketball court. And so what we do is the percentages does help out, but using formulas to calculate the amount of force that's being uh, built up throughout time. And then, you know, once we're able to see that they can control movements, you know, at a certain point, then we start looking at the velocity and things like that. Cause you, you don't want to add too many things at one time because it can kind of like throw everyone off, but you want to like 
build their, be able that they able to handle their body weight first. From there, start externally loading them, making sure that the load is similar and mimics what the amount of force is being applied. And then we look at how fast they can move that and can they maintain that. And so I love man's work on uh, Brian Mann's work on um, velocity um, training. So I try to implement it later on at a certain point so that we because there's so many things going on at one time. What I don't want to do is overwhelm me and the other strength coaches as well as the players. I want to really focus on certain things at certain points. And so we try to minimize and control that. Yeah. And, you know, the conversation of load is everywhere, especially at the moment. Um, as a league, obviously, the NBA is a bit of a traveling circus at times. Um, mm-hmm. and with that, obviously, presents some load challenges in season. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. How much kind of structured training can you squeeze in in the season itself? Uh, good question. So what I've come to the realization is um, you really can't truly periodize. <laughs> during the season so it's a what we'll, what we'll do this season is it's a 10-day floating periodized program so we'll have three basically um certain types of lifts that will be uh, executed within that 10-day period and uh, we'll hit key things with the res- residual training effect in mind and also what cities we're going to um i try to do a lot of my big lifts and everything at home and then on the road, we hit certain things because, you know, it changes a lot. I like, you know, the weight room could have been one way one year and one hotel. And then the next year is totally different. You won't know till you get there. Or you may have access to certain equipment to one um, in one arena. And then the following year you come back, you know, you don't have access to that same stuff. So you, we have to make sure that whatever I do on the road is, is uh, I could be consistent with it. So I travel with a lot of stuff. But the 10-day floating um, periodized program really helped out. I did that um, when I was with the Magic uh, for quite some time. And, uh, and, I, and I thought it went very well because I was able to um, monitor it a little bit much more effectively week, weeks at a time versus looking at a whole calendar. Mm. And are the players allowed to wear wearables when they're in a game situation or only in training? Um, well, one is they, they're not allowed to wear it in the games. According to the CBA, basically... Uh, it's optional. It's up to the player if they want to wear it or not. But it's not allowed in games at all. And and I would, to be honest with you, I I really can't comment on that because it's um that's the collective bargaining agreement. That's the CBA. But I know for sure they cannot wear it in a game. And I know for sure it's optional. So it's up to a player if he wants to wear it or not. And with that kind of in mind, how how do teams typically try and uh, measure the intensity of games and the kind of like physiological effect it's had on the player? Well, so you have a second spectrum. So you have these camera systems already in the arenas that basically records what's happening. And so they record their movements without a guy wearing anything. They just, they have, they know who they are and they track them. And so um, they're able to get speeds, accelerations, and then those things are weighed uh, with other uh, devices that are being used um, throughout certain teams. Yeah. So you can still pull some information to guide what you do on the road with loading and training. So the biggest thing is, is like uh, one, it you know, if you look at short term and long term um, goals when it comes to collecting this type of information. So, for example, if we're if we know a guy reached the max speed at 14 miles per hour and this is what his max speed is throughout the you know, let's say that's the average max speed for him, through, you know, for competition. And then um, what I'll do is I'll look at that for off-season programming. You know, what is the max speed and what can we go over when we think about the overload principle? Now, the other thing is, uh, that's a, I'm sorry, that's the long term. Short term is more like, you know, with the seasons going on, how much load is being placed on them? You know, how many acceleration, how many deceleration, you know, what's happening to that guy? And that's what the second spectrum data helps us with, along with other things. Now, of course, I'm just sharing some of the general stuff. There's a lot of stuff that we're doing that's different. I can't really talk about, but um, that's generally what teams do is look at that kind of information to feel how much load is actually placed on a guy. And then in conjunction with that, you will ask the guy, how does he feel in terms of RPE, rating of perceived exertion? And then you kind of correlate the two together. So if he did a lot of decelerations in one game and he says it's a one, then, you know, maybe the intensity was pretty low, but then, you know, uh, as a as a good strength coach would know, like or any practitioner, you, you could tell by just talking to the guy if it was really intense or not. Yeah. And um, for the rookies coming through, how big a jump is there for them physically in transitioning to being at a pro level? 
the cool thing is, it's like as soon as they're drafted, they, they're brought in. So, you know, they have several months to prepare for themselves. So they have summer league and things like that. So uh, the strength coaches here before I got here were doing a great job on introducing the load gradually. And so it's all a progression building up. And so the key thing is, is during the season is to maintain a lot of recovery tactics because it's for them, it's going to be a large load. And so uh, ideally you want those guys um, to really focus on staying in the weight room, um, staying ready, focus on their nutrition and things like that in order to um, be prepared. But, you know, nowadays, uh, well, I know the guys that we have uh, are doing a real good job in preparing themselves and staying ready. And I guess for the rookies, but I guess also for any any player in the league, um, a, a keen sort of non-traumatic injury risk is going to be Achilles or patella tendons. Um, do people typically do a lot of structured loading on those sites with those injuries in mind, or is that just generally factored into the training programs? It's a good question. Uh, for me, it's generally factored into the training program, um, and, and I hope I'm answering your question. Um, so w w what I'll do is that's, that's where loading and isometric training comes in play. And, um, and ideally, um, that's why there's a, a gradual progression, meaning body weight, starting strength, blah, 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 you know, going from that point on, um, being able to, uh, uh, focus on developing the muscular, um, uh, aspect as well as, um, letting the tendons, um, being able to absorb that load naturally at the same time. And so uh, I think all the strength coaches I've known and worked with, they, they all think the same way. And I think that, um, you know, doing a gradual progression actually meets those needs. And I'm guessing in terms of kind of the, the qualities that you need as a coach to be in the NBA, um, flexibility is going to rank very high, if not at the top. Um, is there any other attributes that you think people need to be a good practitioner or coach in the NBA um, that may be compared to other leagues or environments? I think um, what one is, of course, you said flexibility. Number two is uh, you have to be able to uh, relate, I guess, well with the guys and, and also be confident with what you're saying. Um, stick to you, stick to your um, your values as a strength coach, not be so star starstruck. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is um, being able to um, how to motivate, you know, uh, how to. Um, motivate as well as being able to influence the players or just any athlete that you work with how to uh, you know the, the significance you basically got to be a real good teacher you know you got to be a real good teacher you got to understand you know their personal things that are going on in their lives how do you motivate this guy how do you get them move get them moving uh, you also got to know you got to be a good listener because sometimes you know these guys may not want to do that exercise either they a they don't understand it or B, they just, they're not, they don't feel motivated or they just don't like the exercise. So you as a coach have to be able to listen and be able to make adjustments based on that in order to still achieve that goal. Because what you don't want to do is, is like, just, just, you know, be a coach where you just, oh, just do it, just do it. And they basically start looking elsewhere, outside. You want to, you want them to know that you care for them as a person. You want them to know that whatever you're saying, you, you know, that you're, you're a hundred percent accurate on the information that you're sharing with them that's why peer review research-based information is so important and and at the same time you got to be able to you know evaluate what they're doing and share that information with them and so if, if you're not a good teacher and not a good motivator um you know you, this ain't for you <laughs> do, do you think you get kind of more of an opportunity to do that in the nba because you've got smaller team numbers than say in the nfl no nah, i think um you know, I was in baseball. I was able to connect with a lot of guys. Um, I've never worked in NFL, but I spoke to a lot of NFL strength coaches. And even though they're responsible for their group, uh, they made a big impact and they last a long, a long time. But what I've noticed, guys that last long in this industry, they one is they're always mastering their craft and they, they connect well with everyone. And everybody knows who that person is and they know this guy knows his job and he cares. But I think in the NBA, even though I have a smaller group, yeah, you know, I have less people, but um I think uh, every other sport has the same opportunity, regardless of how many people um, they have to work with, because they still got to make they still 
yeah, they still got to make an impact with that person. And you've obviously mentioned that when you're at your training facility, uh, you personally do meditation and work out in the morning. How do you look after yourself as a coach to be able to perform uh, when you're on the road and you're under you know high pressure and maybe a little bit fatigue from travel? Well, one one is I, I never think I'm in high pressure, and the only reason why I say that is because I was in the military, so <laughs> I deployed and I've been through high pressure situations um, where um, this is for me is uh, totally different than the military, you know, and so uh, I view it a little bit differently. Um, what I do is to prepare myself. Is uh, you know, I'll I'll find the time to work out to stay healthy. Cause you know, one of the things is I have to set the example. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, keeping my mind right, um, helps me maintain my values. It helps me stay disciplined. And, um, plus, you know, meditation is, I just think it just, it just helps with, you know, the mindset preparing you for that day and, and so forth. And I think that alone, um, helps me um co- be a better coach so once you know the day's ready you know the guys come in i'm already wired i'm ready to go i've you know i've 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 um i've basically um i don't want to say work through my problems per se but i, I want to say i i really you know kept things in order and i'm able to stay a little bit more focused and that's what helps me my biggest thing is to stay focused and be ready for these guys because when they come in here they're expecting me to give them valuable information that will make them a better basketball basketball player. So I have to be, uh, you know, a hundred percent or maybe more to, for these guys. So that way they could count on me and my staff. Yeah. It sounds like it all lends itself to leadership qualities. Yes. Um, you've, uh, you've got a book coming out. Uh, what's the book called and uh, when can people expect to see it? So strength training for basketball and um and it's through human kinetics um uh, through the national strength conditioning association the nsca and it's supposed to be released uh december basically 2019 this year and um actually the bu- book was done between me and javar with actually the main editors for the book and then we have a lot of contributors that have uh, participated such as robbie sicka andy barr um steve smith from the wizards and so mubarak malik from the new york Knicks. so we have a lot of uh um top guys in this industry to help put this book together. And I think it's going to be very informative. I think uh, a lot of young guys, a lot of young strength coaches, um, male, female, whoever is going to be really interested in learning more about this book to, to, to give them the winning edge. And is it kind of geared towards people that are going to be, you know, working at internships and working their way through the collegiate systems or, you know, is it good through to professional levels too? It's for anyone, anyone that wants, anybody who wants to make a, bas- a, uh, a basketball player better, this is what it's designed for. I mean, it's, it's designed for coaches uh, who don't do strength conditioning and just wants to learn what the strength coach does on their team. This is great for them. This is great for uh, player development guys who are CSCS certified and doing, running their own practice. It's just for anybody who's interested in making a basketball player better. Um, and then, I mean, I wouldn't doubt there's other sports that'll be interested in in learning in this as well, because this, when it comes to training, you're looking at specific qualities of training, right? Strength and things like that. And it's great to learn from other sports. Really good. And will, will that be available online as well? Or is it just a, is it going to be a pure textbook? No, it's going to be available everywhere. Barnes and Noble, Amazon is everywhere. Uh, I don't know exactly all the places, but I know Human Connects has a large distribution channel. And so I think one of the things I also think is going to be in different languages. And so, um, so there's going to be a lot of strength coaches that are going to have access to this, regardless if they speak English or not, uh, just because we really want to get this message across. And is this your first publication personally? First book. Yeah. First book. This is the actual one. I mean, I've done articles and, uh, actually written a children's book, but haven't put it out quite yet waiting for an artist. But, um, this is actually my first book and I, I was honored to be asked about this. It's a basically, uh, it's a long process. It's a lot of going back and forth with other editors, but, uh, but it's a great learning experience and, uh, and really to put things down on paper and, and actually share this information with other people is awesome. And has the process haunted you or do you think you'll come back with more books and more publications? I think I'll come back with more books and publications is what I learned from this is, um, 
it, it, it takes a while. You just got to learn how to manage your time. Um, but I think uh, I will come back, you know, I, maybe something after uh, <clears throat> once I leave the NBA, I'll focus on it again. But during during the season, I, I think this would be a challenging thing to do. Yeah, well, hearing about how long your working day is, I'd be amazed if anybody could write a book in that in that time frame. And where can people follow you besides the book? Where can people get access to you or keep up to date with what you're doing? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm on Twitter. It's basically my name, Bill um, Burgos, B-U-R-G-O-S. Um, Instagram, same thing. I periodically put stuff on there when I can. A lot of stuff on leadership. And every now and then I'll find some th- things that I find interesting, share it. And then, uh, of course, on LinkedIn as well. Um, I'm not like a, a, a very savvy social media guy, but when I do share, you know, I, I, it's with intentions of like really trying to let people know that, you know, one is as good as just live life because, you know, there is more than just strength and conditioning. Um, so you want to keep yourself sane, but this helps you be a better coach. And uh, then I'll share things, um, you know, that I see in the news or whatever it is. But on those social media accounts is where people guys can find me, which is Twitter, Instagram, and um, LinkedIn, which is basically my name, Bill Burgos. And of course, you've got the you've obviously got the book coming out for people to check out. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any resources that or, or people that you recommend listeners follow um, or look towards at the moment? Well, of course, you know Scott Scott Caulfield has his own Instagram channel, but at the same time, he has uh, the NSCA podcast, which would be a, a great listen. Um, Ron McKeefery, um, you know, follow play cause they have good stuff on there. Um, I like Joe therapy, Joe Yoon. He talks a lot about the simple stuff of mobility exercises. Um, uh, I think it's strong by science. Um, I can't think of anything else that I normally follow, but I just, I, I I'm randomly looking at stuff and what I find interesting, I'll look at it, read it if it makes sense. Uh, but there's so many things out there. It's kind of hard, to, but those are those are the ones I I, I typically follow and, and and like to listen to. Um, but uh, but yeah, amazing. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. I think we're on the clock there. But Bill, thank you so much for giving up your time today. Um, really appreciate all those insights that you've you've managed to squeeze in quite densely. Well, th- well thank you. Uh, you know, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, we are doing a podcast, which is going to be an extension from this book, and I think we talked briefly about it. Um, so. I'm um, not sure when that's going to happen, but but it's it's coming out soon, though. So I guess if people keep an eye on your social pages, they'll be able to find out when that's coming out. Yeah, I'll definitely share it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as will we. Um, yeah. Brilliant, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for coming on today, mate. And no, thank you. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you, Andy. You're doing a great thing, and um, I think this is great for young coaches to to listen to and and kind of get an idea of what they can do to you know make themselves better. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Well, I appreciate you and um, thank you, man. And, uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to thank Bill for coming on the show, especially as he was just getting settled into a new city and a new team when we recorded this episode. So big appreciation to him for coming on around that time. Guys, thanks for listening to the episode. If there's anything that we've mentioned that you want to check out, then you'll be able to find it in the episode show notes at informperformance.com.